welcome back to our another episode of Book Interviews. This is Starlight here. Today, I'm so excited to have Paul, the co-founder of Digital Art Fair, come to our podcast. Please welcome Paul. Thanks. Really pleasure to be here in London today. It's great to connect up and visit a city that I used to live in about 22 years ago. Oh, so, oh my god. Yeah, it's been、uh, fun getting here on the train today. Thank、yeah. you. Okay, so for the first question, I would like to ask: Can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into your crypto journey? Yes,、yeah, so my crypto journey started, I think, from my university days. I did a computer science degree and worked in computer technology for some of the big institutions here in London. And during that journey, I discovered Bitcoin and just how that could transform the financial system. So that was really exciting for me.、Uh, about ten years ago, I started mining Bitcoin from my home computer, and really going into the code and just geeking out about the whole cryptocurrency space and what it could do.、Um, shortly after that, in 2017, with Ethereum and some of the other coins that started to pop up,、mm-hmm. I invested in some of those ICOs. And one thing led to another, and I、uh, ended up、um, doing a lot of investment into the space during 2017, 18, 19, all up until this year, really. And、um, back end of probably two years ago,、uh, my wife set up a company called Digital Art Fair,、mm-hmm. and、uh, we had an idea for what we could do in the art space, and that really kind of brought us to where we are today with the. Uh, launch of the inaugural digital art fair experience in Hong Kong, and effectively our second、um, uh, big hosted event that we're about to launch. So be excited to talk about that too. Yeah, that sounds so interesting and exciting as well. So for the second question, I would like to ask:、um, You have a few years of a trading experience, especially as an algo trader. So would you share with us what exactly algo trading is and how you process in crypto trading? Sure. Yes. So algos are obviously computer programs that can automate tasks that a human trader would normally do.、Mm-hmm. I know you've had a few of my counterparts on the show recently, including、yeah. Ben. And you know, one、uh, type of algo trading that you might look at is what they call high frequency trading.、Mm-hmm. So obviously, Ben and, and and those guys are real experts in that. You know, very fast trading that happens with computer technology.、Um, algo trading is more to do with. A、uh, set of instructions that you will give to a computer to execute an order over a certain period of time, or certain other benchmarks.、Mm-hmm. And so, a lot of folks who are buying and selling equities and stocks on the stock exchange might use what you call a VWAP. So it tries to get an average price over a certain period of time, and that just helps manage your risk. So you're using a computer to basically manage your risk. And the exciting thing in crypto is that we're starting to see a lot of companies now launch、mm-hmm. their own algorithms. Whether it's a TWAP, like a time-weighted algorithm,、uh, effectively like a dollar cost averaging type algorithm,、uh, to some more interesting, sexy stuff like stealth algorithms and, and other things like that. Is there any difference between the quant trader and an algo trader? Uh, now, I'd like to think an algo trader would be more about an individual making decisions and using、yeah. the computer to trade, whereas a quantitative trader is somebody who is really letting the computer do the decisions based on certain inputs that, and、mm-hmm. signals that it's receiving. For example, like you might want to use a quant trading strategy based on the order book size or certain signals in the market,、um, whereas an algo trader would use a more kind of prepackaged. A、pre-planned schedule to to execute their trade.、Mm-hmm. So those were two differences between them. And the quant trading firms tend to be the very high frequency, sort of higher turnover trading firms. But similarly, they can use quantitative statistics over the course of a, a much longer trade. And what's interesting in crypto is that. Often you've got a lot of metrics on chain, and so there's a lot of analysis that we can do on wallets and things moving around and other signals that can be brought into the quant trading world.、Mm-hmm. I'm sure some of your guests have already touched on this subject. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So let's talk about digital art fair. So digital art fair returns to the central Hong Kong for a special experience show in October 2022. So can you share with our audience what we can expect for this exhibition? Absolutely. So the、uh, second edition of Digital Art Fair in Hong Kong this year、mm-hmm. um, will take place in October, and we will be 
kind of looking at the landscape a bit different from how we did last year. Our focus has always been on the fine art aspect yeah. of digital art, but this year um, it's you know good to be conscious of how the economy is different to last year. Obviously, crypto has gone through a big swing into a bear market over the last 12 months. And I think for us, the way that we look at the art world is that that probably translates, especially in digital art, to lower prices, lower mm. floor prices, as we call it for digital art, and perhaps the appetite for people to buy less or at lower prices. So for us, the focus has been on the experience and taking clients and taking folks who come to the art fair, or really the art experience as we're launching for this month, will be about a journey that we go into, an immersive journey that we go into with a very big up and coming Asian artist who I can reveal on the show today. So uh, I would like to know what is your motivation to do this kind of um, exhibition, like especially focus on the uh, fine art? So I think for us, what we found was Increasingly, when we looked at galleries that mm. were selling art, whether it's in Soho, whether it's Mayfair, whether it's Old Street or broader field in Hollywood Road in Hong Kong or, or the US, or the, 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 the general consensus seemed to be that there was a lack of young faces, a, a lack of younger buyers coming into the art galleries. Mm -hmm. And for us, that was a real shame because the art segment seemed to be increasingly encroaching towards a, a kind of, um, you know, an, an older, more mature audience. So mm -hmm. what we thought about is how can we bring in younger interest and, and keep the young uh, sort of um, uh, uh, perhaps, you know, next generation of mm -hmm. collectors interested in the space and for us the answer was in digital art and, and bringing a digital art experience. What are the strengths of a digital art fair in terms of value creation and um, experience? So digital art fair when we launched our first fair last year was one of the first in fact it was the, probably the first art fair in Asia to focus on digital art mm. and um, one of the things that we aim to do is focus on the fine aspect, a fine art aspect of digital art. And so for us, that means looking at the artists, looking at the history, looking at the piece and the story that goes behind the piece that has been created. You know, digital art has got a lot of different mediums for everything from photography to computer generated art to pixel art, etc. And for our focus in the fine art world, in the digital art medium mm -hmm. in particular, what we wanted to do was really, um, uh, you know, take the um, take the fine art world and move it into a modern uh, era using digital as a medium and, and, and attract a different consumer base and bring in the galleries and, and help bring the community into the modern world, into the digital age. So as we know, the fine art especially uh, represent like a drawing, painting, this kind of stuff. So um, what's your opinion? Like uh, what kind of N NFT work do you think can be caught as the, an, a fine art? Yes, I mean, there's lots of different variations of digital art, isn't there? And, and what I've always believed is a kind of mantra that I've heard spoken a lot, which is when you buy art, you buy art because you love it. Yeah. Not necessarily that the price is going to increase or, or, or a reflection on the price. And so for us, it's all about the beauty in the beholder. So how do you view that piece? What is the story that goes with that piece? Why is it that you bought that piece? Mm -hmm. And so just the same way that, for example, somebody might like a Monet or may like a, you know, a modern day Rafik, yeah. for example, you've got um, folks who really want to own a crypto punk, for example, uh, or you've got folks who really want to own something that tells a different story. So everybody has their own kind of story and, and, and association with mm -hmm. that art. And for us at Digital Art Fair, we particularly specialize on the fine art uh, aspect of it. And mm -hmm. some of the featured artists that we've had, as I mentioned, Rafiq, Krista Kim, mm -hmm. and, and others, um, are, are artists who are um, you know, well uh, you know, choreographed, well curated, and well known in their industry. Do you bought any digital fine art? I have bought some digital fine art. Yes, I have. I mean, for us, the NFT really symbolizes uh, ownership mm -hmm. on, on, on a piece of artwork, just how it could symbolize ownership on a sword in a game, for example. You know, I think we grow up in, a, in an ecosystem where it's very difficult for 
artists to get recognition sometimes. And what digital art is able to do is able to let those artists also be a, a producer, a gallerist, a curator. Mm. And yes, they can go to the galleries and they can um, go that path as well. But they can also, with digital art and NFTs, prove that something has come from them. They can uh, sell that as a, a fixed piece from them. It can be associated back to them. And so through blockchain technology, we're able to give ownership back to the artists, whether they're writing music or whether they're writing paintings or, or even you know, taking an NFT as a, as, a, as a code of law, perhaps. Mm. How NFTs change digital art and the fine art as well? And what do you think the private and public benefits that NFT art can bring? So when I look at digital art fair and what we've done, one of the interesting things that we have explored in blockchain with digital art is to let the artists connect directly to the collectors. And so we, whilst are able to work directly with artists and collectors in displaying their art, we're also keen to expand that with galleries mm -hmm. and build out an ecosystem where people are using NFT and digital art to validate their ownership. For example, we worked with a um, African uh, gallery last year, an Africa, uh, a selection of African artists, which technically would be quite tricky normally because they would have had to have shipped their art from Africa to mm -hmm. Hong Kong, which would have incurred a cost. And given the, the price level of, of, oh, of yeah. their art, that would have been a significant part of the, of the pricing component. And so with digital art, there's no transportation costs or minimal transportation costs involved. And also the artist is confident that when they sell that piece of art, they are able to see the transaction happen. Mm -hmm. It's not just me or, or somebody calling them up and saying, oh, we've sold it for this amount of money. And but really, we sold it for two times that. Oh, yeah. They can validate all of this online through the blockchain. So for us, NFT represents you know, transparency and it represents a connection between the artists, the galleries and the collectors directly, which is indelible and will exist. What is the concept and the vision of digital art fair? So our concept is really to bring together artists mm -hmm. and connect them up with yeah, collectors. Sure. Um, one of the ways that we do that is direct participation from artists. Um, we also have a foundation mm -hmm. which specializes in nurturing up and coming female artists, for example, and people who are perhaps as represented through galleries as they would be traditionally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we obviously are very focused on Asian artists and uh, in particular this year, we're welcoming galleries who we're very keen to partner with as well and help educate the galleries and also help them understand how blockchain and digital art can help their businesses and grow their companies too. Yeah, so, um, and one more question is like I would ask, uh, what is your preference like when you pick up the fine art? digital fine art, what's your preferences? Well, for myself, I, I mean, I only speak for myself, um, but I personally love things that are dynamic. Uh -huh. So with digital art, we're able to represent art instead of just being a static form, we can represent that art through some animation potentially. And one of the interesting exposés that we have this year at Digital Art Fair will be a massive immersive experience with an up and coming artist called Jackie Tsai. Oh yeah, I know him. Excellent. So Jackie's uh, been uh, working with us over the last few months to curate a splendid exhibition, uh -huh. which I think is going to really uh, um, you know, explode the way that we look at art. And for me, one of the passions that I've got is about experiencing art in a new way. And Digital Art Fair is one of the companies that's able to, to help um, you know, drive that initiative and, re and really um, you know, push the envelope in terms of mm -hmm. what people think of is possible with art. Yeah, absolutely. So final questions, but not least. So what is your next step for you as the co-founder of the Digital Art Fair? <laughs> Well, none of this happens without a great team. So I'm very lucky to be working with a strong team based in Hong Kong. We've also got aspirations to go global. Mm -hmm. So obviously being here in London is a great opportunity to connect up and we welcome invitations from galleries and other folks who work in digital art and digital art mediums to talk with us. And in addition to that, I think as we take on a more global picture of what we'll do, um, you know, we look not just into London, but potentially Singapore and other countries as well. So really welcome to bring that message and bring that experience to a new country and a, and a much more international 
uh, uh, focus. Yeah. Whilst our home will always be Hong Kong, I think there's an opportunity to really um, you know, take this and, and, and work with partners globally to make this uh, experience available to a lot more people. Yeah, that's so excited. Thank you guys for watching today's episode. If you like the content, please comment and like and subscribe our channel as well. Thank you, Paul, for coming. And it's really my pleasure to speak with you today. I will see you guys next time. Bye.